Well, ladies, hello. Welcome to, can you believe it's 2024? 2024 Pastor's Wives Conference. Golly. I really thought Jesus would have come back by now. Before the election, please. Anyway, welcome to the um, workshop on uh, depression, anxiety, and suicide. It is a tough topic, but something that we desperately need to talk about in the church. And so I'm thankful that I've been asked to, to share on this. Um, thankful is an interesting word, but I am thankful. So my name is Patty Height, and I have a ministry called Out of Egypt Ministries, which is a ministry to the church, to equip the church to better uh, understand and therefore minister grace and truth to the LGBT plus community within their community or within their home. So if you want to check out that ministry, it's just out of Egypt ministries.org. Um, I do prayer posts on Instagram. I must have typed in something wrong because it's at height Patty instead of at Patty height. So <laughs> do it backwards. And then on Facebook, it's just Patty height. And uh, I don't open messenger. Um, I know a lot of people ask about that. But my home church is Calvary Chapel in Old Bridge, New Jersey. Pastor Lloyd Pulley and Karen Pulley, she's on the board on the East Coast, and I've been there for 21 years, and it's it's a it's a blessing. So this workshop is um, how to understand and therefore minister to those who might struggle with depression, anxiety, or suicidal thoughts, and the spiritual battle that lies within that. So Heavenly Father, will you please be with us now as we go through this, this workshop and this time together, Lord God. Will you do a mighty work in all of the workshops, Lord God? Lead and guide and direct. And for all of us that are sharing, would you please empty us of self and fill us with you, Lord God, so that you are the one that is uh, being thought of, being turned to, and being glorified in all of this. So we love you and we praise you and we lift this up in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I am so thankful. Don't you just love Gia? Yes. When uh, I got saved 21 years ago at Calvary Oldbridge, she was a little 18 or 19 year old uh, teenager learning worship music. And she was one of the people on our worship team at, at Oldbridge uh, a gazillion years ago. But this Psalm, I actually just taught a, a women's retreat a few months ago. I taught on Psalm 46, four messages on Psalm 46. It was amazing. I love this Psalm. And so when we sang it this morning, I'm like, this is really good for our workshop. So I'm going to start with some of the lyrics to Psalm 46, Lord of Hosts. O come, behold the works of God, the nations at his feet. He breaks the bow and bends the spear and tells the wars to cease. O mighty one of Israel, you are on our side. We walk by faith in God who burns the chariots with fire. Lord of hosts, that means Lord of armies. Lord of hosts, you're with us, with us in the fire, with us as a shelter, and with us in the storm. You will lead us through the fiercest battle. Oh, where else would we go? With the Lord of hosts. Oh, God of Jacob, fierce and grace and great, you lift your voice to speak, and the earth it bows, and all the mountains move into the sea. Oh Lord, you know the hearts of men, and still you let them live. <laughs> God who makes the mountains melt, come wrestle us <laughs> and win. And then it, um, it continues on and it says, Though oceans roar, you are the Lord of all, the one who calms the wind and waves and makes my heart be still. Though the earth gives way and the mountains move into the sea, the nation, nations rage, I know my God is in control. Mm -hmm. And oh, that is what we need when we are going through times of depression and anxiety that can lead to thoughts that um, want us to go home to the Lord earlier than his design for us. Amen? Amen. 
So because this workshop is for us as leaders in women's ministry, this is going to be talking about how to minister to women, certain women, I love our theme, uh, within the church who actually have a relationship with Jesus. Women that are dealing with depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts. It's a different story when we try to minister to someone who's experiencing depression and anxiety if they don't know Jesus. For that, we point them to the gospel for salvation before anything else. So this is one of the most challenging messages I have written, and I believe it's for several reasons. And I'm curious if it's because depression and anxiety and suicide, listen, are one of the most prevalent things the enemy is using against us right now to cripple us and draw us the church away from the goodness of God. Mm-hmm. All my life you have been faithful. Mm-hmm. All my life you have been so, so good. With every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. Oh, how we need to do that when we're in a place of depression or sadness. We must trust in the goodness of God, even when we are crushed and weak, or should I say, maybe even more so when we're crushed and weak. We don't live a life that's not crushed and weak because we're Christians. We have seasons like that. So I just want to say right from the start, I am not a therapist. But I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. Remember those commercials? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Got to lighten it up a little. <laughs> I am not a licensed counselor, and I am not a medical doctor. I will not be speaking about clinical depression and what happens in the brain chemically to those who suffer with that or other mental disorders. I'm not qualified to do that. Most of us are not. But I do have very, very personal experience in non-clinical depression and all that comes with that. What I am is someone who cares. What I am is someone that has experienced all of this and the Lord has beautifully met me and delivered me through it each and every time. And notice I said each and every time. Sometimes it's not a one and done. But our God is faithful. It's one of his attributes. It's his character. And his character never changes. I find so much peace and comfort in that. Because our feelings change. Our circumstances certainly change. But he remains the same. He is our steady. But since we are talking about depression and anxiety and even suicide, it's important to understand what they are described as medically and clinically, even though I won't be speaking about the medical part. So clinically, they are described as this, depression, major depressive disorder or MDD, also known simply as depression, is a mental disorder characterized Listen, by at least two weeks of pervasive low mood. Well, that might be a lot more people than we ever thought of. It's low self-esteem, loss of interest in normally enjoyable activities, low energy, that's for sure, and pain without a clear cause or common symptoms. Also, there's an inability to experience pleasure in previously enjoyable activities. Depressed people may be preoccupied with, you ready for this one? Or ruminate over, that's a biggie, ruminate over thoughts and feelings of worthlessness, inappropriate guilt or regret, helplessness or hopelessness. I've experienced all of that as a Christian. More so as a Christian, because before I was a Christian, I was masking it all with drugs and alcohol. Now I feel. Anxiety. According to psychology today, anxiety is both a mental and physical state of negative expectation. Mentally, it's characterized by increased arousal and apprehension, tortured into distressing worry, 
and physically by unpleasant activation of multiple body symptoms as such as jitteriness and a racing heart. Patty height? Check. Sometimes heat makes me nervous and I get a jittery heart. I was in session today and thinking, oh girl, <laughs> your heart is going, right? But if we don't take those thoughts captive, it can cripple us. Suicide. According to Psychology Today, suicide often stems from a deep feeling of hopelessness, the inability to see solutions or problems, or to cope with challenging life circumstances that may lead people to see taking their own lives as the only solution to what is really a temporary situation. Oh, it's so hard to recognize it as a temporary situation when you're in the midst of it. And depression is a key risk factor for suicide. Check. And I'll share more about my personal story later, uh, but that's clinically. But now I want to say, like, how do we talk about and minister to these diagnoses and symptoms spiritually and biblically? Please hear this. This is one of the reasons I think this workshop is important. We must get over the stigma that depression or anxiety is a lack of faith. We must get over the stigma that depression or anxiety is a lack of faith. While it can be for some, there's many reasons, but there are many in our churches that have a strong faith and they're even leaders in ministry, but they're still dealing with depression during certain seasons of their lives. We just learned about uncertain times. There's also certain seasons in our lives that just can cause these things to well up. It may be, I just wrote this a couple of days. I was definitely having a hot flash when I wrote this. <laughs> it may be a season of menopause. Did anybody, I mean, there's no cameras, right? Did anybody go through menopause and have anxiety attacks during menopause? Did anybody tell you ahead of time? No. Why? Why are we not talking about this? I did too. Finally, my doctor's like, it's your hormones, honey. It wasn't a lack of faith. Lack of estrogen. <laughs> so let's be mindful to find out what season this woman that we're women or woman that we're ministering to, find out what season she's in before we think in our heart that she might be far from the Lord. Find out first. She might be, and that will be a certain type of counseling, but she might not be. It might just be a certain season in her life. And so when I dealt with my depression and anxiety, I was incredibly close to the Lord. I clung to him. I didn't have a lack of faith. My faith was all I had. My faith is what got me through. So people need to be encouraged in their faith, not discouraged because it seems like they might have a lack of faith. That won't help. It'll cause more dis just depression and anxiety. They're feeling lonely and ashamed for being a Christian and yet struggling with this. It's such a shameful feeling as a Christian. We have to invite in. <laughs> we need to come alongside them and hold up their arms and hold up their chin and tell them that they're going to make it through because when you're in the midst of it, you don't think you are. Tell them just to hang on a little while longer. God is moving on their behalf. You forget things. You forget some of these simple things when you're in the middle of it. Wait, oh, that's right. God is working on my behalf. Okay. So being a Christian and struggling with depression and anxiety does not nece necessarily mean that you're a weak Christian. It means that you're going through a time of weakness and pain. And for those, they need our help, not our criticism. Charles Spurgeon had crippling depression. Did you guys know that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Charles Spurgeon had crippling depression. He understood depression isn't always logical. And sometimes it can happen without even having a clear cause. Was he weak in his faith? Did he stop preaching? 
No. He did take time off, though, to go get rest. So here's a quote from one of his lectures uh, that he was preaching, and it's in Old English, but I think we should be able to understand it. So this is Charles Spurgeon. As well fight with the midst as with this shapeless, undefinable, yet all beclouding hopelessness. One affords himself no pity when in this case, because it seems to be <coughs> unreasonable and even sinful to be troubled without manifest cause, and yet troubled the man is. Even in the very depths of his spirit, it needs a heavenly hand to push it back, but nothing short of this will chase away the nightmare of the soul. Charles Spurgeon. He experientially understood. So let's look at some biblical examples of mighty men of God who have gone through a time or a season of weakness and depression that led to suicidal thoughts. And as we do this, I want to point out their time of depression and suicidal thoughts came directly after two very big yet different situations. One situation was after extreme loss and one was after a mighty work of God. These two different situations had the same effect on these mighty men of God. And these two men are Job and Elijah. So let's start with Job. Was Job a weak man with little faith? No, no. Oh, well, Job 1.1 1, 1 tells us. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Job had a beautiful family and much wealth, and God had blessed him greatly. But the, the Lord allowed the enemy to come in after him, like after him, and Job lost everything. He lost his children, his wealth, his personal health, and for a time, he lost supportive friends. His friends were like, what are you doing wrong, Job? Hmm. All of these were devastating and out of his control. Job had no control over this situation. He didn't cause it. He didn't bring it. He didn't sin to make it calm. God, does, does God really work that way, though? Well, you've been sinning, so I'm just going to wipe out your whole family. It's not our God. But in all of that, Job never cursed God. But you know what he did? He cursed himself. Job 3.1 after this, Job opened his mouth and cursed the day of his birth. In verse 11 in Job 3, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I not perish when I came from the womb? That's deep pain. And he knew the Lord. And I will say many Christians who are in a season of depression think and say the same thing within themselves with our language. They don't curse God, they curse self. It might sound something like this. God, I love you so much. Oh, I love you, Lord. But I just can't take this pain anymore. All my days feel so dark, Lord. I have no strength to go on. Please just take me home, Lord. Please just take me home. I'm ready. I don't want to live anymore. Life is just too hard. Have you ever heard something like that? If you have, have you ever said something like that? If you have, I'm sorry you've experienced that kind of darkness and pain or seemingly never-ending health situation. Health situations can cause depression. No answers can cause depression. It's those uncertain times, right, when it comes to health. And if you've experienced that, and if you've thought that, I'm thankful that you didn't give up. I'm thankful you're still here with us. And I'm thankful that you did a really good job holding on. Because it's not always easy. What Job didn't realize, though, in the midst of his severe pain and loss was God still had a beautiful plan for his life. Right? He didn't see that. He couldn't. He didn't understand it. But because Job held on, we get to read about the beautiful omnipotence of God in chapters 38 through 41 and the restoration of Job in chapter 42, especially verse 12. 
Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. We must hold on. There's so much more for us and for those who are struggling. God is not done. Encourage one another to look forward instead of dwelling on the current pain or looking too much at the past pain. Mm -hmm. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13. We know this. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, evil, to give you a future and a hope. Then you will call upon me and go and pray to me and I will listen to you. And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. So if God's thoughts are to give us a future and a hope, then our thoughts should be toward receiving these thoughts for our future, thus giving us hope. Daily hope. We need daily hope. Things, are, things aren't going to get easier. Oh, Lord, strengthen us. So we know that this promise is to Israel, but it's also a good and a powerful statement to us about the goodness of God. Now, he doesn't necessarily deliver us from troubles, but he will give us the hope and the strength to thrive as we live through them. And sometimes thriving might look like weeping buckets of tears on your face in your bedroom or in your kitchen or whatever, because you're crying out to the Lord in desperation, that's thriving. That's clinging to the Lord. The Lord doesn't spare us from suffering. He tells us to join him in it. Sometimes we just need a change of perspective. But it's really hard to do that alone. Because there's those ruminating thoughts going on and on and on in your brain. And it's hard to do alone. And we know Hebrews chapter 10, verses 24 and 25 tells us this. Let us, and this is in New Living Translation. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Oh, to motivate one another. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. We need to encourage each other face to face. We really do. When someone is depressed, they need more than a text message. They need to see your face and feel your touch. They might not be able to talk at all when you go visit them, but you go anyway. And if they let you hug them, even, I mean, if they let you, if they say, can I give you a hug? And they say yes, and they stiffen the arms, that's okay. They need your touch. Touch is so important. Researchers are finding that hugs are powerful tools for mental health. Dr. Christy Kane, I did not research her, so I don't know who she is, but she did a study on the power of a hug. Studies show that she actually, and other, other doctors, studies show that when we hug another person for eight seconds, our brain releases a bonding chemical called oxytocin. Way better than Oxycontin, <laughs> right? It's the better oxy. Yeah. Wasn't there a facial cleanser called oxy? Anybody? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Sorry. That's how my brain goes. <laughs> but hug someone. Hold them if they let you. And I find that very interesting because I love hugs. But if they're not comfortable with touch, that's okay. Then you give them a little something to nibble on and a glass of water because they're probably not eating or drinking. When I went through my last time of depression, I lost 25 pounds in two months. Mm -hmm. You sit there and you pray for them or you sing a song over them like Jesus sings over you. You give them that cold cup of water. You visit them in this prison that they're in. As Jesus talked about in Matthew 25, verse 35 and 36, Jesus said, For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you took me in. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, 
and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. When you're depressed, oh, you feel sick, so sick. And you feel like you're a prisoner in your body because there seems to be no escape from the emotional pain. And then verse 40, Jesus says, Assuredly, I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let's be true servants of the Lord. And listen, people that are experiencing depression and or anxiety, it's not easy. It's, it's not a let's go over and hang out visit. It's ministry. And so as you do that, there's a good chance that they might try to isolate, push through that, and just show up at their front door anyways. They probably feel all alone. And the listen, they can have 100 friends. They can have 25 best friends. But the enemy is telling them that nobody cares. And do you know what that word nobody is? No body. There's no body, no physical person there with them. And that is the enemy's playground. So when they're alone, the only conversation that they're having is with themselves and their mind. When they're ruminating over all the dark, horrible lies that the enemy is just throwing at them left and right. Because he's having a field day with them or with us. So invite them to your home for a meal and fellowship and tell them they can come with their hair a mess in whatever, do you guys even wear sweatpants? Oh, I mean, I lived out here for three years, but not in Corona. It's very hot here. <laughs> Invite them to your home for a meal and fellowship. Acts 2.42. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread, and in prayers. They need more than a text message saying, thinking about you and praying for you. And if for some reason you can't go visit, call them so that they can hear your voice. Or if all you can do is text, at least text and say something very specific, like, I'm praying for you right now. Please let me know what your biggest challenge is today. I want to pray for that specifically. Or if you have an iPhone, Thank you, because then you keep all the texts blue. <laughs> um, and I don't know about you green text people. I don't know how it works on your phone. But if you have an iPhone, you can do that text thing with the voice, right? I have a dear, dear friend who just lost her mother in January. Her mother was young. She was like 62. Very sick for a number of years. And this friend is opening up to me and saying she's challenged right now with the goodness of God. She's a worship leader. She has an amazing voice. But I text her and sing her a song every day. I'll go, I'll look. It started with the goodness of God. And then I'll go and I'll look through my Spotify account to find a song that talks about how good God is. And I'll, I'll sing it to her. I don't care what my voice sounds like. She needs to hear my voice because I couldn't be with her because I'm away a lot. She's away. All right. So now that was Job. Let's talk about Elijah. And then I'm going to share a little bit of my story and then some practical ways that we can help ourselves if we're the ones that are depressed and a little bit of how to help others. But before I get into the scripture about Elijah, I want to share this again from Charles Spurgeon. So Spurgeon warned his students to be aware of situations in which they may be more susceptible to depression. And we know that was how many years ago? What was that? Like whatever, 16, 1700s? I might have it in my notes here. We'll see. So this is a list of some of the things that can lead to depression that he experienced personally. And he wanted to pass this list on to them for them to be aware because he wasn't thinking, oh, they've been raised up. Listen, these are my students, so they're going to be good and they're never going to suffer with depression. He knew it comes, it could come for any of us. So this is what he listed. When you have prolonged illness or physical problems, when you do intense mental work and heart work, when you're lonely or isolated, 
when your lifestyle is sedentary and your brain overworked, did he have foreknowledge of computers? <laughs> when your lifestyle is sedentary and your brain overworked? I think he posted that on Instagram. <laughs> Before or after success, we'll see that with Elijah. After a heavy blow, that was Job. And through a slow pileup of trouble and discouragement. Those all sound familiar, don't they? Mm -hmm. This reads like a page from a 2024 book. The enemy has not changed his tactics at all. So Spurgeon knew how to offer compassionate and practical advice to those who were suffering such things, even in his time. He did not chastise them or criticize them. He encouraged them and prepared them. He let them know that their situation was not uncommon so that they wouldn't feel less than. And so my hope for doing this workshop is that we would learn to do the same thing. So as we look at Elijah, I want you to keep these words in mind, what I just shared, and as well as these words that I pulled out from that part. But they're in direct correlation with depression, anxiety, and even suicidal thoughts. So keep these words in mind. Fear, isolation, self-pity, giving up, excessive sleepiness, and believing things that are not true. So let's look at Elijah in 1 Kings 19, but first we just a quick backdrop, just in case someone's listening to this in the future that might not know the story. Um, we know that God did a mighty work in 1 Kings 18. The Lord just did a miraculous work on the top, top of Mount Carmel to reveal himself as the one true God, defeating all the false gods of the Baals. Has anybody been to Mount Carmel? Yeah, it's it's amazing there, isn't it? Can't believe he ran down that mountain. And you sh 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 but the Lord used Elijah mightily, mightily in this work, mightily. You know what I'm just thinking of with Elijah is James chapter five. I don't know what verse, but it says, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. And he prayed for the rain to, now I'm paraphrasing. That part is, Elijah was a man with a nature like ours. That's King, New King James. Now the rest is paraphrasing. And he prayed for the rain to not come. And it was, what was it, uh, three years and six months or something like that. And then he prayed again for the rain to come. But don't you just love that it's Elijah was a man with a nature like ours? Oh, that's so comforting to me. So Elijah, the Lord used Elijah in this mighty work. But let's see what happens to this mighty prophet after the mighty work. First Kings 19, verse 1 and 2. And Ahab, who was the king, told Jezebel, his hmm, lovely wife, and Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. So basically, you know, Jezebel's like, I'm going to kill you just like you killed them. Better watch out. So because Elijah was, Elijah was threatened, he became fearful. Is that understandable? Yeah. Was he forgetting or negating the mighty work God had just done? No, nope. but fear came in and it overwhelmed him in the moment. And he was probably weak from the great work that God had just done. And, and, and all joking aside, I mean, he did run down a mountain. When did he eat? Like... Was he, who knows what type of weakness he was in in that moment. And so fear came in. And so maybe we can try to find out where the women that we're ministering to actually feel threatened. Find out where they might feel threatened. So as I share my story later, later you'll hear what that feeling of being threatened did to me. Then Elijah isolated. So we have fear and isolation. Verses three and four. 
And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, listen, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. Then his fear totally gripped him so fiercely that he would rather die than deal with the situation. Rather die than deal with the situation. So continuing in verse four, he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life for I'm no better than my father's. So it is enough is basically saying, Lord, I've had enough and I just can't take anymore. Go ahead and take me home. Have you ever said that? We're in good company, ladies. But I want you to notice that the Lord did not scold him for a lack of faith. Instead, the Lord sent an angel to minister to him and to feed him and to give him water, as Jesus calls us to do for those who are hurting. God did that for Elijah. But even in that, Elijah was ministered to in that way. After he ate and drank, you know what he did? He laid back down again. Depression does that. You can't sleep enough, and yet you're so tired. So what did the Lord do with that? He sent an angel back to him a second time and told him once again to arise and eat. But this time the Lord said, because the journey's too great for you. God knew how hard the journey was. And then the Lord gave him strength for 40 days. And then God started speaking to him himself with words like in verse 9. And there he, Elijah, went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him. And God said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, I hear the Lord's voice within my heart in such a gentle tone, not a stern tone, not like, what are you doing here, Elijah? Hello? Well, God's not from Jersey, so he wouldn't probably say the hello. <laughs> I hear it more like, hey, honey, I see you kind of hold up here in this cave. What are you doing here, sweetie? But I've responded the same way Elijah has. I've, I've gone with self-pity and I've reminded the Lord that, but Lord, all that, that great work and that I'm here all alone and there's people seeking after me to hurt me and they've threatened or wished me dead, which I'll share again when I share a little bit of my testimony. My life has been kind of threatened in a sense in this ministry. And in all of this, the Lord keeps speaking to Elijah with gentleness, with a still small voice. The Lord did not point out all the wrong that Elijah was doing. The Lord came to him to tell him how he was still going to use him and to assure him that he was not alone. Oh, loneliness is so hard. Ooh, loneliness is a hard one. If you know single people, spend time with them, especially if they're older. If there are some older single women in your church, widowed or never been married, so they're probably hearing all kinds of lies from the enemy with that, spend time with them. Invite them over on holidays. Even if you think... Many other people have already invited them. Ask. Just the asking will be a blessing to them, especially widows. So the Lord assured him that he was not alone and that he was still going to use him. And then we know that this is when Elijah passed the mantle to Elisha. And Elisha went on to do great and mighty things for the Lord. Who knows? The Elisha, we or the lady we're ministering to, what Elishas are coming in our lives. So was Elijah a weak man in the Lord or did he have a weak moment after the Lord used him for a great mighty work? Was he weak or did he have a weak moment right after God used him mightily and he was probably spent out, poured out, and Jezebel threatened him with his life? I don't think he was a weak prophet. I think he had a weak moment after amazing ministry. So how about you? Are you a weak woman 
or are you just experiencing a season of weakness because you've had great loss or because the Lord's been doing a great work and a great and mighty thing in and through you or through your church or even through your husband. Or maybe it's because the Lord's bringing you to a season where you're going to pass the mantle to someone else. And it's hard because you've had years of ministry. And what, what will my life look like now, Lord? We have pastor's wives that are, their husbands have gone on to be with the Lord. It's hard passing that mantle. You've been in ministry for 30, 40 years. So please don't get down on yourself if that's you for feeling depressed or anxious. You are in good company. And please don't go through it alone because you're in ministry so you feel like you have to be strong. Talk to someone about it. So now I'm going to share a couple of experiences of depression and anxiety that, that I experienced and what I did during that time that helped and what others did during that time that helped me. I have a history of sexual abuse. And so praise God for all the healing that he's brought me through with that. It's beautiful. Lots of, lots of beautiful healing that he's taken me through through the years. So when my abuser died, I wasn't expecting to experience the depression and anxiety attacks the way that I did because I already had so much healing. But there were thoughts moving around my mind so rapidly that it literally felt like I was spinning. I did not know I was going to respond that way. I struggled getting out of bed. And when I finally did, I barely made it to the couch. I was a flight attendant for United Airlines at the time. And I just was thinking, I'm going to lose my career because how am I, how am I going to, how am I going to drive to the airport? But how am I going to work a flight where I'm in charge, where I'm the one that I'm supposed to be there to help somebody else if they're anxious about flying or if they have a heart attack? I was emergency queen. There was all kinds of emergencies that happened on my flights, medical emergencies on the plane and planes, just, you know, engines going out, all kinds of crazy things. And yet I did because I got up and spent time with the Lord and I just did. I just went. I took steps of obedience. When I would read God's word, when I had off, I would read God's word all day long but sometimes it felt like I had dyslexia the word seemed scrambled but I never gave up being in the word it was my lifeline and the Lord spoke to me so intimately in it I use my Bible as a journal I don't really use a journal my Bibles are journals and uh, I have many of them that have so much of my life written in them um, and praise the Lord, I have to keep getting new ones because I'm getting older and I can't see. So um, it, it's nice because now I, I can't go to the Bible. I'm like, well, I know it's on, you know, on this side of the Bible, uh, up on the top on this side. It's, it's all new every like every two years. I barely ate or I overate. I had to force myself to shower and brush my teeth. I had a hard time taking care of myself. But in all this, I clung to the Lord. He was my comfort. When we know and say that the Holy Spirit is our comforter, he really, really is. You can trust God's word in that. I made a special playlist of songs that were only worship. Deep, deep, penetrating songs about God and his holiness and goodness that talked Almost the whole song pretty much talked about him and very little about me or us. A whole playlist of that. It was going all the time. And I told my closest friends what was happening and they were there for me. They were present. And one of the hardest parts in this season for me was the recurring thoughts of the abuse. Now it's back where the Lord had already done a lot of that healing and cleaning so in that, I felt like I was experiencing it all over again. I did everything I could to make those thoughts and that pain go away. But what I needed to do was invite the Lord into the pain instead of trying to escape it. 
because pain always demands a response. We will respond to our pain in one way or another. Whether it's in the physical or in the emotional, pain always demands a response. I had one friend, a pastor's wife, that talked to me every single day. Whether it was talking or texting, but oftentimes it was phone calls. And I kept apologizing for taking all of her time. And you know what her response was? That's okay, Patty. I know this is only for a season. That wasn't harsh. That wasn't like, oh, I'm only going to talk to you while you're struggling, but then woohoo, we'll see you later. You're on the way. That was beautiful. I know this is, isn't going to last forever. It's only for a season. See, to me, in the midst of it, it felt like this was going to last forever. I was already thinking, how am I going to live since I'm going to lose my job as a flight attendant? And I was doing ministry. I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose this. I'm going to lose this. And this is my forever. How am I going to eat? Ruminating thoughts, the lies that the enemy brings in when we have those seasons of weakness. And that's what happens with depression. You feel like there's no way out. The enemy tells you this is your new and forever normal. And I thought I'd become a failure in God's eyes because I wasn't handling this well like a stronger Christian would. What a lie from the pit of hell. The Lord used me mightily during this season. All I had to do was step out in faith and obedience and he did the rest. One of the times is, is in my home church when I was experiencing that. I'd, I'd shared my testimony in, in smaller ways at, at my church. It's a pretty large church. That was when Pastor Lloyd, you know, he didn't know what I was going through. He, I wasn't going to go to him about this. I went to women. And he's like, all right, Wednesday night, you have the night. You're going to share your testimony. And I'm thinking, I can barely breathe. So Wednesday, I got to shower and brush my teeth. And man... I was shaking, literally shaking, and then the worship music started, and everything went away. Yeah. And I was able to go up there and share my testimony in a powerful way, and people were moved by it. And I'm not saying that about me. I'm saying because God called me to do something that I literally could not do. Lloyd's a man of God. If, if, if God wanted me to share my testimony in any, any other season at my church, he would have told Pastor Lloyd that. God wanted it then. Sure. It was beautiful. It really was. And then, without warning, it happened. Remember when Elijah's like, oh, Lord, it's enough. Well, for me, the Lord said, enough. And when the Lord says enough, it's enough. And we never know when he's going to say enough. It might be two weeks. It might be two years, but when the Lord says enough, it is enough. It's done. But I was trying to be like Elijah prior to that, declaring my own timeline, saying, it's enough, Lord, just take my life. I'm so tired. But again, only when God says enough is when it ends. So my enough that came from the Lord himself is when I was reading the word and the Lord redirected me to read Mark chapter five. Everything changed with one word. Arise. Mark 5, 41. Then he, Jesus, took the child by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kumai, which is translated, little girl, I say to you, arise. You see, she was dead. I wanted to be dead. This little girl was dead. And he told her, little girl, arise. God himself spoke to me. God spoke to the part of my heart that was reliving all the trauma because of the death of my abuser. Little girl, which is what I was, little girl, I say to you, arise. Verse 42 of Mark 5. Immediately. The, you know, I love how many immediately's there are in Mark. Mm -hmm. Immediately, the girl arose and walked, for she was 12 years of age. 
So in an instant, I knew the depression was gone. Wherever my Bible is from that phase, I wrote it right next to that. It was done. I put it on my arm. I needed the combination of my friends not giving up on me, me staying in the word, worshiping to his holiness, and continuing to serve him, as well as the Lord speaking directly to me. So I was so thankful when that season of depression, uh, when it came, it came from loss. I'm so glad that that ended. And I never thought that I was going to go through any type of depression again because I was healed in such a miraculous way. But that didn't happen. That time it came from loss, and this time it came right after mighty works of the Lord. There were threats against my life and ministry as well as the loss of a dear friendship. 2023 was one of my hardest seasons as a Christian. In the beginning of the year, now I this Jersey girl, I'd moved out to California. I came out um, in 2020 for COVID for two weeks to flatten the curve and stayed for three years. <laughs> I loved it out here. It was lots of ministry going on. It was It was a beautiful season. But 2023 came and it became a difficult year for me. So in the beginning of the year, I was invited to Chicago to speak, ready for this, with speaking on LGBT stuff, sexuality and gender, and how God delivers you from that false identity. I was invited to Chicago to speak in public high schools, sharing my testimony of how the Lord delivered me from that false gay identity. Yeah, through a ministry called Decision Point. They're amazing. Look them up. So yes, public high schools in Chicago, and the Lord moved miraculously in those schools. In five days, I spoke 17 different times, traveling 430 miles from place to place within the greater Chicago land area. A mighty work of the Lord. I was exhausted. I guess I thought I was 25 years old again, <laughs> instead of 30. <laughs> <laughs> I can't remember if it was just before or just after that, but somewhere around that time, I had some real heavy protests forming against me in San Diego, as well as the University of South Carolina. San Diego, the school, because I spoke at a, a church that meets in a school, the San Diego school board called me saying, you need to get down here tomorrow at 2 p.m. We're going to have our lawyers here, police officers you need to be here. You know, this is after I spoke. When I spoke, there were protesters outside. Uh, San Diego Channel 7 ABC News was there. They wanted to enter. Like, it was crazy. And so I had to call Pacific Justice Institute, ask them what to do. Then Al Mohler got a hold of it, and he talked about it on his show. And I'm like, I'm just a little old Patty Height that just wants to tell some people about Jesus, and you can be set free from the lie of homosexuality. <laughs> so it was it was interesting but it was a mighty work of God. And then in South Carolina, I was speaking at the University of South Carolina and some pa pastor, uh, he didn't call himself a priest, but he called himself a pastor, but he had the collar on, uh, formed a huge protest against me. So uh, the police had to become involved, said horrible things online that I believe in conversion therapy and the people that don't go through conversion therapy, I believe that they should be killed and that he has proof that I said people should be killed. He said that I uh, spoke that I was the second coming of Jesus Christ. So there was a huge uproar. Everybody was in that area was believing what he said. And um, so the school didn't know what to do, but other people were writing saying that is not who, that's not what Out of Egypt Ministries is. So the police, like, they had to know what type of car I was in, what exact time I would arrive. And so we arrived and the police was there. They moved the barrier. And then follow, we had to follow his police car. He opened my car door for me, walked me in with his hand on his gun and his head on a swivel, walked me in. I had to sit in a special room. And then leaving, I asked him, I'm like, please please let me talk to people afterwards. Let me go out and talk to the protesters, please. And he said, absolutely, ma'am, I cannot. So he escorted me back to the car. We got in the car. He escorted us to the end of the parking lot, moved the barrier, and we went on our way. That was very hard. The people, I was staying with people from the church that invited me, and 
you know, husband's driving and we're, I'm, his wife's in the front seat and I'm in the back seat. And she's looking at her husband going, honey, where are you going? This isn't the way home. He's like, I don't know. What if someone's following us? I'm going a different way. I mean, it was crazy. It was crazy. But oh, did God move? Because it was a trans, the transgender person sitting in the front row. I can't remember who it was sitting also in the front row over here that, because I did a QA. I'm like, Lord, let's do a QA. There were people with the uh, rainbow flag sitting over there doing QA. I mean, God moved mightily. Mighty works of God. Then I was receiving threats against me personally, as well as my church, saying specifically how they wanted me to die and how they hoped someone would come in and shoot up my church. So I felt threatened, like I mentioned earlier when I was talking about Elijah. But it was great and mighty works that God was doing. So I didn't realize how fear was bottling up inside of me because God was doing such amazing things in ministry. But the hardest part after all of this came the loss of a dear friendship. And so when that happened, I was pretty worn down. I experienced a sadness over that loss like I never had before, and I actually got pretty sick. And I will say is um, Lauren, Lauren was speaking this morning about, do you have uh, any, anything that's happening that's, that's, um, I forget the word she used, uh, interfering, that's not the word, uh, with your relationship with God. Competing. I had a friendship that was competing against my, my time with, with God and looking to God. When things were happening, it, I didn't go to God first anymore. I texted my friend. And God is holy and righteous, and he doesn't want us to have relationships like that. I'm get, you guys are all right, right? We're not going to be first in line for dinner. I just, uh, Ruth Bueller gave me this book. She is. No, I'm just kidding. Sorry. So sorry to point you out. That was just so mean. Sorry. Grab me a taco. <laughs> Um, Ruth Bueller sent me a book last year called uh, The Seeking Heart by Fenelon. Has anybody ever read that? Holy shnikes, Batman, that's an awesome book. So this is what I read. Um, this is what I read the other day. The, the Danger of Friendships. He's from 1651. All right. It's a natural to want to have a good friend whom you admire and like. It is a great pleasure in life to have friends, but friendships can be full of danger, especially if you live in community with a close circle of people. As a member of the body of Christ, you no longer belong to yourself. In a group that needs to honor the Lord Jesus, you must guard against forming special friendships. These will lead to cliques, hello, I mean, isn't that what every group youth group says? Oh, how do you like like youth group? Great, but there's so many cliques. I mean, he was talking about this in the 1600s. This will lead to cliques or a party spirit. Sometimes when someone you like has been hurt, you become emotionally involved and pick up their offense. This will cause division in a house faster than anything I know. You are soon plotting and chatting in secret and a sense of divisive, divisiveness permeates the entire affair. Of course, you appear to yourself without blame and insist you're the only one standing up for what is right. Others watching this are harmed and you set a bad example for them. And then it continues on. And that's, yeah, that, that happened a little bit. And so there was that. And then the enemy was about to have a field day with me. Like I had never experienced spiritual attacks like this before. When I would sit down to read God's word, I would get super dizzy and my eyes would start to go out of focus. When I was in the New Testament and reading the words of Christ in red, I would come very close to passing out and get super nauseous. Did I stop reading? Absolutely not. I got my bucket and sat it next to me in case I actually did throw up. Because if I stopped reading, do you think the enemy would have let up on that at all? No. I mean, God would have said enough when he wanted to say enough, but I was not going to let this stop me from reading the word. God's word is my lifeline. Jeremiah 15, 16, for your words were found and I ate them and your word was to me the joy and rejoicing of my heart for I am called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. When I would go to church, 
I was able to sing worship out loud, but when I was by myself, it felt like there was duct tape over my mouth and I lost worship. I couldn't sing out loud and that's always been my go-to for battles. On Sundays when my pastor began preaching, I would immediately feel like I was gonna pass out. I would actually try to figure out if I should lean left or right in case I did pass out because I didn't wanna cause a distraction. That lasted for a couple of months. And whenever I would try to work on the waning friendship, I would dry heave. I was a mess. So through all of this, I experienced depression and severe anxiety attacks. It was just too much. It's too much for me to handle. But I clung to the Lord in such intimate ways. My faith in the faithful one grew so much deeper. The nights were so hard that I could actually I would actually sleep holding my Bible and, and for every time I woke up, then I could just open and be like, okay, God, where? I downloaded apps on my phone that would read God's word out loud. So that's all I would hear in my ear through the night. But even in all that, every morning I would wake up with such dread. It was the first thing I would feel in the morning was dread. Dread that there was another day that I was going to have to experience this severe depression and anxiety. I wasn't able to understand that this was going on. Um, what was happening was just going to be temporary, again, even though I went through it before. It felt like my life was over. But I'm so thankful for the friends that opened up their home to me and let me stay with them for a while. And when it all became too much, I called my papa pastor, Lloyd Pulley, and told him what was happening to me. And he immediately told me to come back home to New Jersey. So I was living out here in California. And so I did it so I could have ministry on the West Coast to be with new friends out here. And once I came back to New Jersey for a break and was around those who I'd known for over 20 years, I felt relieved. It was then that I had knew that I had to move back to New Jersey for the support I needed for myself and for Out of Egypt Ministries to continue. And so I'm happy to say that that season of depression and anxiety is over and I'm filled with great joy again. And I share this with you, ladies, in hopes that you will understand that depression and anxiety and even suicidal thoughts can come to any of us at any time. We need not judge those who are going through these seasons, understanding that it could happen to any of us. And none of us are exempt or immune from the attacks of the enemy and experiencing deep sorrows over loss and the hardships that living in this fallen world bring us. What we are to do is comfort those who are in need. The best way we can do that is to be available. We don't have to have a degree in counseling. Be available. Love right where they are. Listen, listen, listen. And I'm, I'm just going to say it again because I think this is the Lord. Sing to them. Just sing to them. There's something so beautiful about music, singing God's words. Sing the Psalms over them. Turn on Shane and Shane. Let them sing. And while it's comforting to have someone walk alongside you that has experienced depression and anxiety themselves, it's also very helpful to have those who've never experienced that to walk alongside you as well because they have different types of boundaries. So please don't think that because you've not experienced this, you're not equipped to walk alongside someone who has most of my closest friends have not gone through the things that I have, but they've been my greatest places of comfort simply because they've walked alongside me through it all. And they didn't try to give me answers. They were just there. They were simply present. So they were God's present to me. And we'll end with 2 Corinthians 1, verse 3 through 7. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all of our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also abounds through Christ. Now, if we are afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, salvation which is effective for enduring the same sufferings which we also suffer. We're in this together. Or if we're comforted, it's for your consolation and salvation. And our hope for you is steadfast because we know that as you are partakers of the sufferings, so also you will partake in the consolation. 
So we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We just, Lord, be magnified. Yeah. Be magnified on the sunny days and the cloudy days. Be magnified when we're doing really well and be magnified when we're in our weak seasons. So just take this workshop and do with it what you will, Lord God. In Jesus' name we praise you. Amen. Amen.